Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, ICOM seminar series on keeping in touch. Uh, it's a, it's a, a series that uh, delves into the issues that today face uh, the museum community worldwide. And clearly, uh, could not be more timely to have today a seminar on digital transformation for museums in the time of COVID-19. So uh, this is uh, clearly a burning theme, and uh, I am uh, particularly happy to have today a marvelous panel of speakers to tackle this uh, very, very complex issue. In particular, we have with us Catherine Devine, which is the business strategy leader for libraries and museums on Microsoft Redmond. We have Luisa Unoja, who is Chief Museum Education Officer and uh, National Commissioner for Museums and Monuments at Oya, Nigeria. We have Ramiro Martinez Estrada, director of Museo, Museo Amparo in Puebla, Mexico. And we have Maraikes Malegange, who's the, uh, who's the head of digital marketing communication uh, at the uh, Rijksmuseum Amsterdam. Um, I am Pierluigi Sacco. I am a professor of cultural economics at IULM University in Milan and a senior advisor and the head of the, Muse of the Venice office at OECD. So a brief introduction to the topic before giving the floor to our um, very, very competent speakers and we really look forward to hear from them. The issue of uh, digital transformation of museums is clearly not something that has been provoked intrinsically by COVID because uh, this was already underway. And uh, the point is that of course, the pandemic crisis that we are living today uh, is exacerbating many of the issues, but also probably um, creating uh, different opportunities, so stimulating a transition that could have probably taken longer. And that in this situation is uh, of course pushed. What are the main issues at stake? Well, one issue of course with the digital transformation is that of course, uh, being able to participate in a digital environment is also an issue of uh, enablement and capability. Are people uh, put in the condition to participate actively in the digital sphere? And this also means, of course, uh, the infrastructural endowment. Are people in the condition to, the technological conditions to participate? One of the issues that is emerging very clearly in this situation is that uh, uh, clearly there is a, a big concern uh, about uh, the uh, possibility of the disenfranchised, the less uh, enabled and, and the less entitled people from the economic and social and educational point of view to actively participate. So clearly this is a burning issue and uh, we, we uh, and it's just an exemplification of the many possible uh, problems that can arise. On the other hand, we certainly have uh, very, very important possibilities in terms, for example, of creation of new experience models. So the digital, dimension, of course, is not alternative to the physical one. It's a matter, of course, of a complex synthesis of hybridization. And what kind of models can emerge from this? Can we enrich the possibility, for example, of museum experience for people who don't have a museum training and using, for example, digital tools to expand the knowledge base or to uh, let people understand better the subtleties of the museum devices formats? So these issues are clearly all encompassing, uh, we do not have the pretense of solving them today. But on the other hand, uh, I think we can give uh, a very interesting stimulus for further reflection. So this seminar has been organized by ICOM in cooperation with the French Ministry for Culture. And we are uh, very grateful for their support. And for those of you who are not uh, at, uh, at ease at following the seminar in English, uh, you can look for the translation on the Zoom platform on the, on, the, on the bottom, you will find the indications for accessing the translation. And if you, you are on the Yuka platform on the top right. So uh, we will uh, also remind you that uh, there is a, a, also um, uh, a survey that we ask you to, to, to fill. It's a very simple survey and I will remind you about this uh, close to the end of the, of the seminar. It's a very, very short one, but uh, extremely useful for us to understand better what is the situation today in the museum community around these critical issues. So your contribution will be most welcome and we will be most grateful for you to, to, to help us understand better what's going on in this particular respect. So without further ado, 
I would like to give the floor to the first one of our panelists, and in particular to Catherine Devin from Microsoft. Catherine, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pierre Luigi. Um, really delighted to be here with everyone today. Such an amazing panel, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so. I am at Microsoft. Some of you may know me um, from my time at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, um, but I have um, primarily a technology career um, of which the last 10 years was in museums. And then I recently joined Microsoft to lead up strategy for museums specifically um, at Microsoft, um, which gives me a really global view of what is happening in museums and, and also a global view about what is specifically happening around digital transformation. and technology. So what we've all heard, and I think we all know at this point, is that um, technology, uh, you know, COVID um, introduced, you know, lots of transformation really, really fast. And at Microsoft, this is, we've seen this across every industry, not just museums. Um, we often talk about, you know, 10 years in 10 days, or <laughs> in some cases, or 10 years in 10 months. Um, I think the, you know, it, it raises an interesting point, which is um, why does it take a crisis to achieve the innovation and the change that comes with it? Um, and um, you know, there's no doubt that, that, that it exacerbated this and this has been good for us, I think. Uh, sorry, the virus has not been good. The change in the innovation that comes has been good. Um, but we could have done it all along. And so the question is why? And so I, you know, with this holistic view, I've sort of noticed some, some trends, both before and after that have been really interesting. And so one is, I think crisis, you know, creates necessity. And so we have seen, you know, from immediately at the crisis, everybody looked for how can I create my museum in a digital world? And uh, shortly after that, uh, then everyone started looking at reopening and people started looking at um, things like, well, how can we reopen in a safe, environment. Um, and so they started looking at things like time ticketing. So lots and lots of museums that had never had to worry about ticketing um, or certainly not worried about anything other than general admission were now worrying about how to do time ticketing and how to, you know, do those kinds of things. Um, so that's all new. And then we actually at Microsoft think that there's a third phase still to come, um, which is reimagine. And we don't feel this is just in museums. This is across all industries. But, you know, there's an acceptance we won't go back to where we were. And so what does reimagining look like? So a couple of things that I think we're already starting to see. Um, so one is this idea of accessibility. So we have inadvertently been making our museums inaccessible, certainly not through intent, um, but by requiring and focusing on the experience of people physically coming to a museum, we have inadvertently limited people. And so um, there are so many stories now of like, now that we're doing digital engagement, even if it's not yet perfect, uh, and I accept that we're still learning, the, the challenge has been that we are now finding that more people can come. So even I can attend things in Europe, just like we are right now, without actually physically needing to be in Paris. Um, or in fact, we're all over the world, right? So it's, it's facilitated this kind of an engagement, which previously, we probably wouldn't have done through a webinar. We probably would have required people to travel. So now, and all the people who are attending today. So that is still true in museums as well. So we think about, and there are lots of reasons why people can't attend a museum. They don't live in the same city. They can't travel. They don't have the economic means. They have childcare as well as physical disabilities. So I think that that is maybe the one thing that I think will, will um, persist. And people will actually see that digital transformation is about achieving the museum's mission and not about digital for digital's sake, um, which is where I think we were for a long time, um, certainly early on of we need to have digital because you know it, it makes us look current and relevant. So that's one thing, but then I also look at, so what are we seeing around what are the barriers to adoption? Why have we, why has it been so challenging for this? Um, and I think there, the real thing here is not a technology. It's an organizational change um, issue that we are increasingly seeing. And it's a digital literacy um, issue. So it's, not, you know, I often 
sort of split digital literacy into two things. One is the ability to do things technically. And clearly there is a limited, you know, access to resources globally and also limited resources in museums. But the second one is actually not being, um, not being able to understand how technology can help further your mission. So, so you don't, that does not require you to be a coder, a technical person, it just as a museum director or in museum leadership, it's about understanding how technology is yet another tool in the toolkit that lets you achieve your mission. And, um, and so when I think we, we, you know, for a number of us, our measures are around reach. How can we achieve more reach around whatever it is, our mission and our museum? And, and so clearly digital is a tool to achieve more reach. Um, and we have to find the right way to engage because what we do know is that how you engage physically in a physical building is quite different to how you engage in, in digital. And so I know that there has been increasing conversation now about digital experiences that go beyond digital collections exploration, for example, that goes beyond um, you know, just a website and into, um, into um, much more sort of like a digital exhibition. Um, and it remains to be seen what is an effective digital exhibition, um, for example, but those kinds of conversations is something we're starting to see more and more of. And I think the other area that has definitely been embraced more is education in museums. So, um, you know, I, I often talk about um, the example of what we saw in Italy during COVID, um, which is Italy, of all of the countries in the world, um, was the one that was most concerned about how their museums reached out to their students and this lack of access to culture uh, during the pandemic. Um, and so, that, so that's where a whole bunch of programs start up around um, how to reach out to classrooms virtually and how to do that in a safe way for children, um, because clearly we don't want them on, you know, public, uh, you know, Zoom calls and Teams calls and things like that. So I, am, I, see, I think we're seeing more innovation in education and recognition that we can reach anybody anywhere in the world, children, and it's really great for children. Uh, not just children, but lifelong learners as well, to be exposed to different parts of the world. I think it's a, it's the next step in globalization. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll um, let the other panelists speak. But I mean, that's the, that's what we're seeing, and I think that there's some interesting, um, there's some interesting outcomes out of this, which I think will ultimately be for good, um, but challenging for everybody. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, it was really, really inspiring what you said uh, in so many different respects. Um, one point that I think emerged very forcefully is that the capability issue here is not only from the side of the audience and the public, it's also very much on the side of museum professionals in this regard. When you said, for example, that uh, many museum professionals are unaware of the concrete possibilities that the digital is opening up, this is, of course, something that has to be considered very carefully. Also because, you know, there is also from the traditional uh, museum studies uh, community, sort of suspicious attitude towards the digital, as if the digital was taking out the soul, so to speak, of the museum. Clearly, we understand that this is not a case, as it has not been the case for all the technological innovations that have, of course, uh, uh, popped up across the history of uh, not only museums, but human culture. So it's very important to maintain an open-minded attitude in this respect. The other aspect uh, that I think is absolutely important to highlight here is the possibility of this uh, tremendous innovative synthesis between uh, cultural participation and access and education. Because yes. clearly this is one of the frontiers for the future. And uh, by the way, it's also in some sense uh, mending this uh, absolutely absurd contraposition between cultural experience and educational experience as if they were two different spheres. In yes. some sense, they are part of the same continuum. They are part of the same ecosystem of knowledge. So it's extremely important for us to reconnect. Also because today the instrumental emphasis on education, without considering the cultural side of this, I think is impoverishing a lot educational curricula, but also experience model for people. So that cultural policies in the end have to, in some sense, to fill the, the gap because of this limitation in, 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 in vision that is today so much ingrained in so many educational systems. So, I mean, big issues are emerging. So yeah. now I am uh, really 
happy to give the floor to Luisa Unoa from, uh, from Nigeria to, to understand also what is the perspective uh, on, uh, let's say, I, I, I tend to see Africa today as probably the most exciting laboratory for innovation for these kind of practices, even if sometimes this is not widely recognized. So I'm really looking forward to hear from you. What is the view uh, from there uh, on the, the possibilities of digitization of museums? Luisa, floor is yours. Thank you, Luigi. Um, well, from this side of the globe, um, we wake up um, to the realization of the pandemic, just like um, every other place in the world. And uh, seriously speaking, we were not envisaging that up to this time, our museum's doors would be shut you know, to the public. And it's um, really disheartening. But um, that notwithstanding, we, before the pandemic in Nigeria, we had some museums had, um, had already put in place, you know, they had already in their budget and in their, um, uh, uh, in their agenda to begin digital uh, transformation processes. But however, we were not able to achieve this before COVID-19 came. Okay, so, COVID-19 came and we realized ever than, ever than before now that we cannot do without digital platforms. If we are to remain open to the public, if we are to remain to be accessible by the people for which we were created, the museums I mean here, if we are to engage rightly, if we are to continue with, with education, which is a core area of a museum uh, uh, service, then we need to we need to follow suit on the um, digitalization of um, our our museums. Um, so uh, in this vein, I'd like to speak about the Baghdad Heritage Museum, which is uh, a museum uh, located in a very remote area in Nigeria, but an area which goes down in history as a very important one because. Um, the, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, which happened uh, several decades ago, several years ago, uh, cannot uh, be, the story of that, uh, um, uh, uh, of that slave trade of that time will be incomplete with the Badagri, with the people of, without the Bad, people of Badagri. And so Badagri is in a remote place and schools, most of the time, the, 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 the clientele, you know, the people who come to Badagri Museum are school children, school, school people, school going uh, people. And it's a place of history. And right now they can't access, they can't go anywhere, they can't, and they can't even see what they see this uh, museum online. So that's, a, that's one big problem that we have in Nigeria. I don't know if it's the same in most African, but I think it is, actually almost the same, but it's a, it's a big challenge. And we now ask, where are we? I mean, in the face of all of this, where is Nigeria? Where is the museum? I mean, the museum, if the museum becomes inaccessible, the workers are not relevant any longer. The objects are not relevant. The object, I mean, everything is just there on a standstill. So where is the enablement? which is the problem that we have. There's no enablement to, you know, get us to these digital uh, platforms. And that is another one. And then in the process, we, uh, we, we were able to get the ICOM Alif Palliative, which is right now helping us to put Badagri Heritage Museum in, back into limes. Of, of all objects in the museum to create virtual exhibitions of heritage sites within Badagri and you know to make the Badagri, uh, the Badagri Heritage Museum accessible to people to go beyond just line. I mean, everybody can access, can come to the museum from wherever they are all over the world. So that is where we are right now. Um, um, uh, we agree that digital platform right now, digitalization of all virtual museums and all, 
is, is, is the in thing. That is the only way to go about it first before we begin to look into other things. Um, as we speak today, uh, my country is mourning because we, um, I don't know if you heard over the news, but there's an NSAS protest that is going, going on by the youths. And um, yesterday, lots of people were killed, you know, and so it's, it's, it's still, it still looks very real that the museums will still have to go back again. The doors could still be, in fact, there's curfew in Lagos State as we speak. So people, all workers are home, nobody's moving around. And so even more than ever before, we're still needing, we're still going to need more of this digital representation, um, the way I see it. Thank you very much, uh, Luisa. And uh, I think uh, you, 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 you gave us um, a, a very strong wake up call also in terms of uh, how important it is to conceive of the relationship between museums and civil society and what can be the role, especially in the moments of crisis like this, also for mobilization, for example, digital access from this point of view in a moment of physical restraint clearly can make the difference also in terms of uh, providing uh, information, vision, coordination. And the fact that this kind of um, social action comes from the youth is particularly interesting because this is where the museum can really enter a conversation that uh, can be transformational in this regard. We have to consider that, for example, there are already forms of juvenile culture that are making the difference. For example, in other, uh, in this moment, in other protests around the world, I think, for example, in Thailand, the role, for example, of K-pop funds in uh, creating a platform for calling for more democracy from the bottom up, from the youth point of view, is something that already shows us that the culture can become a possibility to mobilize, for example, juvenile forces around the issues that have to do with democracy and participation. Do museums want to be part of this conversation or not? So it's up to us. It's up to us to find a way to enter this conversation naturally and to empower, for example, these juvenile forces to participate in a conversation in a more proactive way, but also seeing the museum as an enablement hub for this kind of uh, democracy and active citizenship phenomena. But mm -hmm. another uh, continent in which these issues are today very much debated is South America. And so I'm really happy to give the floor to Ramiro Martinez Estrada for his presentation. Ramiro, floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre Luigi, and uh, thank you, Icon, for the uh, for the invitation. I think we are all facing uh, uh, similar challenges, and uh, the first one I, I would like to say we are located in Puebla, which is the Mexico's fourth largest city. We are three and a half million. We are a private institution with a pre-Columbian collection and a contemporary Mexican collection. Uh, the first is accessibility, but uh, internet accessibility. That is, uh, that is an issue in which we are dealing uh, right now. Uh, many of the communities around us have uh, difficult access to internet. So that poses another, uh, another uh, problem uh, when we're working uh, uh, digitally. That and uh, also what you mentioned at the beginning that we've been, uh, this, this is more an evolution and something that was hastened by, the, by COVID. Uh, we've been working for the past four years in digitalization of our, uh, of our collections. We've uh, done, we've gone streaming of uh, all our presentations and our, uh, interviews and dialogues for the past three years. So we have a, a, a large archive. And uh, the, the problem is, what do we do with that uh, archive, with that library? How do we make it accessible on a, in, a, in an interesting way for people to, to look at it? Because it's like, when you see so much information, there is a reaction sometimes where people are a bit uh, wary of, of, uh, of, of how to how to deal, uh, how to deal with it. So, uh, and again, going back to the to the accessibility, I think that is, and that, that's a point that is that is posing and will pose a problem because, in a way, we are becoming we are becoming available to larger populations through uh, through internet, but still we are not available to a large segment of the population who has no no access to computers or, or uh, internet. 
we have uh, been working during the past four months specifically with primary schools trying to uh, develop uh, programs that work with our collections in order to help them with uh, with their their school uh, with their school programs so uh, it is uh, it is a challenging time i think there is a lot of there are many oppor opportunities uh, but still i think we still have a uh, we still have a very long long uh, long ways to go and uh, I think these conversations are interesting because we can see how other other uh, other institutions and other countries and other uh, museums are, are 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 dealing with uh, with the program. Thank you very much, Ramiro, also for pointing out how the issue is not simply technological preparedness in itself, it's the social and economic preparedness, not only to make the technology available to everybody, but also in terms of uh, developing the right uh, social attitudes. For example, the fact that there is today a large part of population in many, in many countries, which uh, in some sense uh, it's excluded by the from the conversation, uh, is of course um, extremely serious and uh, we could even think of something like a new notion of digital poverty so to speak because of course uh, these forms of exclusion are also the causes of future forms of poverty that are that is not only cognitive poverty but could really become social and economic poverty very quickly or could uh, reaffirm already existing forms of poverty. So thank you. And I, I think this is a big issue also that uh, should probably be considered more carefully by the international institutions that work on development. For example, I'm naturally thinking of the World Bank that is already very active, for example, in the digital enablement, but probably this is really becoming one of the issues that uh, needs to be addressed uh, as soon as possible. And now we come to Europe, and uh, I am particularly mm, happy to give the floor to Mareike from Rijksmuseum, because Rijksmuseum has been a beacon of innovation in this transition towards digital society, and also, for example, in terms of a very participative use of, uh, of uh, collections and the creative remixing of content, but uh, I'm not sure that this is uh, necessarily the point that Mareike wants to deal with. But uh, clearly we have, uh, to, in this case, uh, we have the, the, the pleasure to have one of the most interesting and challenging uh, innovation hubs in Europe for uh, digital transition in museums. Marijke, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, listening to the former speakers, I realize in what uh, luxurious position we are here in Holland where we have 100% internet accessibility for for every uh, everyone who lives here and and also in, in most parts of of, of Europe um, and that's something that we I think have to take into account when we are looking at um, developing more content for more people in the world because that's really what we're trying to do we're trying to be as accessible as possible to uh, actually the whole world. Um, I have some I have some videos, something different, but just just to show what we have done in the last couple of months, um, because obviously we had to close as well. So I'm just going to share the screen with you, and then um, so as um, already was said, we started. So the Rex Museum connects people, art, and history, and we started with digitizing our collection already about 18 years ago, because we have uh, over 1 million objects. You can imagine that to start digitizing uh, 1 million objects, that's a huge uh, task and we still have not finished. Um, and uh, eight years ago, we launched Reich Studio where we put uh, 600,000 of our objects uh, in high resolution uh, on, the, on our website. Uh, and people can download them in the highest resolution possible and they can do whatever they want to do with it. So we're really trying to liberate the art and, and let people uh, do whatever they want to do with it. Um, and that's been a, quite a success and it was quite a new thing for the museum world because everybody was very protective of their rights of the images. And we said, you know, this art is, is, from, is for everybody in the whole world. So we want to liberalize it. Um, and then, uh, obviously, we had the same as everybody. Um, we were overtaken by COVID-19. Uh, and we thought, okay, what are we going to do? We had to close, so we have to do something that is not physical, but we have to do something digital. So we were focusing on our digital channels. 
by telling personal stories uh, and bringing the museum li literally uh, in your home. So within a week, we, uh, we launched Rijksmuseum from home. And uh, the first thing we did, we asked our curators if they would like to make a short video from their home and telling a story about an object from our collection. And I have a short video to show you um, a short compilation. Like most of you, I'm working from home. I would like to tell you something about William Craig's. Let me explain. Uh, Marijke, we don't see the video. We don't see the video. Oh, my no, you should share the screen. I, I did share the screen. Oh, so oh, well, great. Hi. Okay, let's um, see how I do this. Because you are a co host, I think. So let me check. No, you're not. So I, I asked to the to the to, to the technical coordination to make Marike a co-host so that she can yeah. share the. Do you see anything now? No. Let me check. I don't think you are. Yeah. So maybe if our um, organizers can help us. To, to, to enable Marike to share the video. She simply has to be made a co-host. Hmm. Sorry about that, but... Uh, Not working. Doesn't seem to work. Um, Uh, let me check. Yes, now you can. Okay, let's see. Do you see? Brilliant. It, it works. Okay, so the first video I'm going to show you is a video uh, with all. Oh, sorry. Hello. Can Hi. you see it? Hi, sure. Like most of you, I'm working from home. I would like to tell you something about the Let me explain. Yes. So this was the first uh, series we made uh, literally within a week. Uh, we started with this. Um, so our curators sitting in their homes and telling stories about our collection. So our collection was still um, sort of accessible for the public. Um, and the second thing we started doing is making, um, I don't know if, if you all know our museum, but we are most known um, with our collection of uh, paintings by Rembrandt and Vermeer and um, the Gallery of Honor. That's one of the main um, uh, uh, well-known uh, galleries in our museum. So we made a virtual tour of our Gallery of Honor where we have included also the audio tour that we already um, had made. And let's see if I can show you that one as well. Oh, this is one of the reactions of the people who, who saw our videos people from all over the world responded and were very uh, happy to have some support and, and comfort uh, in the difficult times. So this is the video of the virtual tour of the Gallery of Honor. Let's see. from below. Wings heaved wide, feathers flying. So this, this virtual tour, um, what we heard back is that a lot of people in elderly homes were, were also very isolated. So the people who were helping there, they were helping them and, and showing this on uh, several screens. Uh, and it was a nice way to, to look at the art and to learn a bit more about our, uh, about our works. 
Um, and then we uh, reopened again, luckily, uh, although we have not a lot of visitors. Um, and then uh, our curators could come to the museum and tell a bit about the collection, but then in the actual museum. And we call it Rijksmuseum Unlocked. So that's an... Oh, sorry, this is the other one. Here, Unlocked. So it's the same start screen, so that makes it a bit difficult. And on that particular moment when she looks up, the tenderness and the happiness protect the temple from evil. The flowers are everywhere in Dutch art. Here we are at the top of the right. So as you can see, we try to make um, very accessible videos, not too long, not too difficult, but really to get the interest of people and, and, and let them really enjoy our collection. And the last thing I want to show, it's not a digital project, but I think it's a very uh, nice way to, to get out there and show um, uh, the world what you have to, what you have to offer. And that's something we did with the, the most important painting we have, which is the Night Watch by Rembrandt. Sorry, this one. Here we go. Last one. I find it geweldig. It's full of the eight. What I mooi vind aan de nachtwacht is dat er zo'n klein meisje even tussen de manschappen doorheen kijkt. We weten dat het voor bewoners van verpleeghuizen heel lastig is om naar het Rijksmuseum te komen. En daarom brengen wij de nachtwacht naar hen toe. Dus we gaan met drie levensgrote nachtwachten door heel Nederland reizen. En bij verpleeghuizen blijft hij dan een week staan. Uh, dat is echt werkelijk waanzinnig. Tot slot had ik dat natuurlijk niet zo heel droog. Nee, ik kan het nog niet begrijpen, maar het is zo. Nou, waar we nu staan is echt een droom. En ik had nooit gedacht dat we hier de nachtwacht, of in ieder geval levensgrote print, naartoe zouden brengen. Mensen hebben natuurlijk niet weg kunnen gaan en kunnen voorlopig ook niet weg. En daar ben ik ook zo blij dat wij in samenwerking met Philips en het Elizabeth Art Fonds de nachtwacht hier kunnen brengen. En dat vind ik zo knap van Rembrandt. Dat hij juist dat uh, gedetailleerde, de gezichten, de, het leven erin brengt. So this is, uh, these are some examples of the things we have done um, the last couple of months. We will uh, launch a new website as well at the end of November. Um, but again, I do realize that we have a luxurious position uh, in terms of uh, accessibility and, and, and all the, the means that we have in this country. Um, and I really hope that these kinds of videos will, will comfort and inspire people from all, from all over the globe. We will continue doing that uh, for, the coming, uh, for the coming years. Thank you very much, Marike. This was uh, most inspiring. And uh, again, so many different issues raised. For example, it's, uh, it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the most important issues in terms of access is the notion that people still have of looking at the museum as a sort of church, a sort of sacred space where uh, in some sense you can interfere, you can be, let's say, a sort of uh, unwanted guest that can uh, break the magic, so to speak. Uh, whereas what you're doing is exactly the opposite, is really creating a familiar space. This idea of having the curators, for example, broadcasting from home or uh, touring the artwork itself in the space that people inhabit, I think it's fantastic and gives uh, a very clear idea also about how the museum mission has to evolve to really engage in a new conversation. So many people who don't feel, uh, don't feel uh, welcome for some reason today. On the other hand, it's also very, very important, this idea that digitization is also in terms of circulation and enablement. The fact that, I mean, you've been pioneering on this idea of 
freely remixing, for example, on museum collection. And uh, this, I think, by the way, is one of the most important things that generally the museum uh, environment tends to overlook. The big issue with cultural industry today is that they have to be very defensive in terms of intellectual property because their business model is about that. But it's not the case for museums. So museums can be much more innovative in inviting people, for example, in creatively appropriating and remixing the, the content in ways that the cultural industries cannot afford. So, for example, in terms of future um, uh, possibilities for innovation. I think that here we have a wonderful possibility ahead and what you're doing. It's, it's true that you say that the uh, Rijksmuseum and, and the Netherlands today are privileged, but insofar as you spend your privilege to explore possibilities like this, I think you're doing a public service because you're really showing the way about the possibilities to many other uh, institutions and countries that uh, hopefully will be on, on their way as well in the next few years. So we have had this first uh, round uh, that was the uh, most exciting. I was taking notes all the time. And uh, I would like to just uh, pick up uh, some of the issues that, that are first, uh, the issues that are coming from the panel, then to also, of course, uh, pick up all the many comments and suggestions that are arriving from our audience. And uh, I will start again from Catherine. And um, when we speak of uh, Microsoft, of, of course, uh, uh, one of the things that probably many people are uh, thinking of in terms of future prospects and always keeping in mind that even we, when we speak about technology, we first speak about social transformation and then technology as a consequence of this. But what about AI? So what are the new frontier of technologies? How the metaverse is in some sense uh, being integrated into the museum space in the future? How do you see this? Oh, interesting. Um, so I think it's careful. I think one of the things that we tend to talk about is the technology and not its application. So I'm a big proponent of what are you trying to achieve? And then the technology allows for that. So, but, we, but specifically around AI, um, I think the most exciting thing around AI and the one that I'm personally um, and professionally interested in is this idea of like, we've talked about digitization and how digitization allows you to um, you know, have digital replicas and then what do you do with it, right? AI allows us to have insights into our collections and if you, of any particular museum, a country's museums and, and, and actually internationally, globally. And, and when, you, when you look at that, um, you can imagine the insights that AI can unlock. So, AI is a whole set of technologies. There's at least 10 different things. It, it ranges everything from computer vision to being able to recognize objects, recognize faces, which I know is a subject of, of controversy, um, but also to read text, to interpret language, um, find patterns, all of these kinds of things. And so I look at, you know, if you took the collections of a museum, for example, and looked at what, it, what are the insights that it can find over time, for example. That is a way to do it. But the other thing is about AI will increasingly become a little like um, functions or in you know, spreadsheets and things like that. It's a part of all technology. It's, it's something that's just built in. And so it allows you, we used to do things like very structured queries that said, look for this and then give me a report on that. Now we're gonna be much more reliant on it identifying insights and bringing it to the fore rather than us having to, because then they're missing. So, um, so that's really interesting. Um, so that's, that's where I see the biggest application of AI um, and um, in, in this space. Thank you very much, Catherine. And now a question to Luisa. As, as I said, I, I, I really see today a very, very powerful drive from um, African youth and Nigeria, by the way, is one of the most interesting countries because the media ecology of Nigeria is as developed as, uh, I mean, as uh, the biggest ones uh, in the world. Uh, we, 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 don't, we tend to, for example, we tend to overlook the fact that the number of movies, for example, produced in Nigeria every year exceeds that of Hollywood. So we are really in a booming media ecology. So it would be extremely important to connect to, to this uh, bargaining phenomenon. And uh, from your point of view, Luisa, what do you think should be the necessary steps? For example, if one would imagine, let's say, a, 
developmental program to enable people to have a better access to museums, what are the necessary steps to take in Nigeria to, 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 to address the issue? You have to unblock your uh, microphone. Okay, yes. Uh, first and foremost, I think that um, uh, um, the government should first and foremost make, make sure that uh, the internet, the internet is accessible. The internet is not very easy. I mean, people do not have access. Not too many people have access to the internet. Aside from states like Lagos and Abuja, um, and then maybe a couple more states out of 36 states in Nigeria, most people do not even know what an in the internet is all about. They don't know what it is. So if um, the internet is not, uh, is, if there's no, if there's no uh, community of, um, of um, this internet users, so creating online platforms in the museums, I, I don't know how it's going to help. Maybe outside and maybe with those other people, but for the majority of the people is really not going to help. Then the professionals in the museums should also have, should be made to have um, adequate uh, training, adequate knowledge on the usage of such, such facilities that we'll talk about, you know, because they are the ones who should be, who should know how to get it across, get their job across to the people if they have knowledge of it but um the training most of most of the professionals lack the training maybe now they can start you know looking into how to to train more otherwise their job is not going to be effective uh, i'm afraid because with the closures and the protests and so many other disasters looming we just have to embrace this online online platforms for museums, it has become very, very important. So those are the two um, major things um, that I see that we should look into first, maybe the government or those who are, you know, if we can take care of these two aspects, then we can begin to talk. Thank you, Luis. Very, very concrete, very specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you for lots of insights from this. And uh, Ramiro, you, you, you pointed out, uh, of course, uh, and it's extremely important how big the problem now is in terms of the digital bottlenecks, for example, in terms of providing access. But I see Central and South America today also as a very dynamic sphere from this point of view. And there is, by the way, a very strong understanding that the social dimension in some sense precedes the technological one in terms of um, enabling people to participate. Do you think that there are some uh, innovative experiences in the, in the Central South American space that from this point of view would be also worth, uh, for example, uh, getting attention from the broader audience for, uh, in terms of uh, practices of uh, cultural access and digitization in the museum space? Oh yeah, definitely. I think, and as somebody mentioned before, I mean, necessity is mother of creativity. So I think there are institutions and it's interesting also that what has happened now, it's not necessarily the larger institutions which have had developed projects, which are, are which are work, work very, uh, very well. And uh, this, for example, what we talking a bit, but, but what we did two months after we, we closed, the closure in Mexico lasted longer. We just opened uh, on the 1st of October. Two months after after the closure, we started working on this project in which we uh, contacted artists to uh, do a brief interview and show us a work in process, a work they were working on. This was a uh, this was there was money. We were paying people also because what happened in Mexico was that everything closed, so a lot of uh, of artists of. Uh, Artists who don't have a gallery, who have difficult access to the market, were, were uh, uh, you know, there was no way of, of, of them getting some, uh, some, uh, some income. And also, it was, it was, 
I think it was necessary to show our, our audiences, you know, how uh, the, 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 the process of creating something, also the artists, how they were living the, the, the lockdown. You know, it's like everybody, just like everybody else, and what it, how it impacted their 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 job, how it impacted their the way they were they were they were thinking. It it was a, a we we're still doing this on a different uh, on a different note. We just uh, relaunched the the project uh, three weeks ago, but it's things like that that I think you know can make a can make a a, a difference. You know, as Mariska was saying with the with the Rijks Museum, this uh, the, the unloading of the images was a big is a is a big issue. We took that and and uh, did that with our pre-Columbian collection, and it's difficult because we we have to go through permits of the of the, of the national government. But it has been it, you know things like that help help uh, help a lot. Thank you very much, Ramiro. And uh, Marike, well, what, what the Rijks Museum is doing is clearly to create uh, a new kind of dialogue with uh, audiences on different premises. But this also, of course, entails tensions with, within the museum community. And I will make a, an example from, uh, let's say, an, an, a recent Italian case that raised a lot of controversy. I would like to, to hear from you what would be your take in a similar situation. In Italy, there was a a sort of uh, outrage that was uh, sparked by the fact that a very famous fashion influencer, Chiara Ferragni, went for a shooting at the Uffizi Museum and she made a selfie with Botticelli and uh, that was uh, spread not only by her own Instagram account but also by the account of the museum. And there was a huge controversy on the fact that this was in some sense a selling out to the authoritiveness of the museum by this uh, cheap, uh, let's say, Instagramming culture and so on and so forth. But of course there were voices from both sides. What yeah. would be, from your point of view, what would be the position in terms of how to connect to these digital audiences and social media? It's, it's interesting. We, we had a similar uh, situation uh, before I worked there. I think about three years ago, we also invited a Dutch influencer um, to come to our museum and, and post something. And we had a lot of uh, uh, reactions on that as well from both sides. Um, and I think, you know, when you are trying to do new things, you are going to make mistakes. That's, that's you know, you cannot do everything perfect. And I think we shouldn't be too afraid to make these mistakes as long as we learn something from it. And what we have learned is that you can um, ask an influencer to do something, but it has to be relevant. It has to have some kind of collect connection with the collection because otherwise you're just uh, a decor and it's, it's really, it's, it's not making any sense. But if you're able to tell uh, a little bit about your collection or one story via this influencer who has a relevant connection with this story, then it can help you to reach a new audience that you normally cannot reach. We had another um, example of a young girl, I think she's 18 or 19, she's a singer and she makes songs and she wanted to uh, um, make some um, uh, pictures and everything in our museum, but her, her um, song was about uh, objects in the museum. And then, you know, maybe she's showing something in a way that we're not used to it because, I don't know, I'm, I'm 20, 30 years too old to really uh, understand uh, that these, these girls or kids like this, but she really talks about something that's relevant within our collection. So I really think you have to look at every uh, individual case, if it's relevant, yes or no. And sometimes you can really use it to reach a new audience of people that you normally wouldn't uh, reach with your own channels. Well, thank you, Marike. That's a very, very insightful and stimulating response. And uh, by the way, it, uh, it invites me to think that uh, what you're saying is that basically it's not a matter of pure exposure. You know, we in the, in the media industry, of course, there is this economy of attention and mentality that whatever grabs the eyeballs of people makes, makes sense just because uh, you, you, you create a new possibility for attention. What you're saying is that uh, attention is not enough. We have to create a sphere of meaning to connect yeah. to. And so, again, 
this is a way in which the museum environment the community can go beyond in some sense the common sense of, of, of cultural industry today and to innovate where cultural industry cannot because of course the constraints are very different so clearly we have less money less resources but also we have more freedom from the point of view of experimenting with new experience formats for example that's very very intriguing very stimulating by the way as a very quick personal note, it's important to stress that, for example, institutions like uh, the OECD, the fact that the OECD, for example, today is centering so, so attentively into the issues of a cultural policy and museums, I think it's a sign of the times, times in itself. You know that the OECD historically was not uh, in, uh, intervening in the cultural sphere and in the military sphere, in the defense. They were the only two fields in which uh, the OECD was not present. Today, the fact that there has been a big commitment and even the creation of a new specific center in Venice that is dedicated to cultural policy and museums, I think is a very, very clear sign that even the, you know, the big economic institutions uh, are reconsidering today. Uh, museums and culture as an area of innovation and, for example, uh, creative fusion with education, which is uh, of a strategic importance. It's very important that the museum uh, uh, community becomes aware of this and uh, I think shifts from what is today still a prevailing defensive attitudes towards these novelties. For, so, for example, the social and economic impact or the possibilities of innovation and hybridization offered by the digital and really starts to embrace uh, this as a new possibility for, uh, let's say, transforming uh, in some sense uh, museums into, into an institution that uh, reflects, of course, the different uh, societies and uh, knowledge uh, uh, and knowledge uh, ecologies of the 21st century. So there are lots of uh, questions that are pouring in from our audience, and I will just uh, drop a couple of them, and uh, everybody in the panel is free to answer if you if you feel like. So the first one comes from Barbara, who asks, uh, who are the professionals within the spectrum of museum professionals that uh, are uh, vocationally more involved in digital content creation? Who's the who are the ones that really are in some sense uh, uh, concerned by this particular transition? Anybody who could uh, provide uh, tips on this? Yeah, I can, I can tell a little bit about it. We started with uh, a specific uh, digital team a year and a half ago. So before that, we had uh, one web editor uh, uh, and, and an assistant uh, who were managing the website. Um, and then we decided to have our own uh, team uh, and make a bigger team because we, we really believed that we had to do more in the digital field they already did, uh, and uh, specifically for making content ourselves. Because if you have to hire agencies to make movies or clips every time, it's way too expensive, and it's much easier to do it yourself. So we really started with um, with a digital team, and it consists now of uh, I think about seven or eight people, which is quite a lot. I I, I truly uh, I, I I believe that, but it really that's why we can do all these things that we do. Thank I you, Maria. It, it's sorry. A, it's a it's a different ball game, as what how we were working before, and the production of content is a big uh, it's a big issue, because again it is expensive to uh, to outsource it, and then also. How, how capable are we of producing something something of, of uh, quality with our, our own uh, with our own uh, our own teams? So I think that is one of the things that that's going to change for the future, and that area is definitely becoming a pivot pivotal uh, in the in the in the new in the hybrid in the hybrid uh, projects that are are I think will be the, the thing of the future. Thank you, Ramiro. And uh, we have, a, we have a, a question from Damali, which I think is uh, really relevant. Uh, of course, uh, digital tools uh, expand possibilities, but they also pose security threats, for example, for users. How can we ensure that, for example, digital access does not uh, create major security problems? And how can we make uh, museums uh, safe spaces from this point of view? Who wants to answer to this? Maybe, Catherine, you can uh, have a say on this. <laughs> it actually allows me to segue to, um, I'll answer the question, but it just allows me to segue to a different point, which is when we talk about digital transformation, we only talk about or primarily talk about 
um, the visitor experience when really digital transformation is pervasive throughout the museum, running the museum, running the building, security in the building, <laughs> um, collections, all sorts of things, right? But we, we don't offer ways of reducing your costs, et cetera, and your risk. So back to the question, you know, we have, a, we have um, there are ranges, there are lots and lots of technologies around security these days. So for example, with a major museum in, in Egypt, you know, we have solutions in place that um, detect when people are running through the building, for example, automatically. And it goes to a central, it's using Internet of Things technology, but it's a smart building basically, right? And, but it's using, it's detecting the fact that objects have gone missing or that people are running through the building or whatnot. But it's really a way of saying there's digital transformation in security systems as well. Um, and I think the person who posed the question, I mean, I think that that is, is relevant. However, I would ask the question, which is, does it mean that it's more likely to be a risk than people who actually go and visit those things anyway, because they're already um, on public display, assuming that they're the things that have been stolen or the things that are on public display. So um, it's, it's a way of saying that there are digital transformation around security systems that can, um, that are far and beyond where most museums are today. Thank you. And uh, yeah, this is clearly a, the, the beginning of a story, I think, of a long story, because clearly the more we will develop this uh, hybridization between physical and digital space, the more, of course, this kind of space will be cramped by different layers with different purposes. And of course, uh, but again, I mean, that's inevitable. Uh, it's, it, it, it's part of uh, the complexity of our societies. And then, uh, I mean, uh, somewhat, somewhat related to this, although less on the technological side, Carmen asks, uh, well, the digital in some sense is, a, is in some sense a threat and a possibility from the point of view of access, because it's true the digital is uh, enabling people, for example, to have access from a distance. But is this uh, probably also, let's say, if not uh, diseducating, disincentivizing people from visiting in presence? How can we manage this difficult balance between the two aspects? Um. Who wants to start? I, I, I can, I, well, I mean, we truly believe that the real experience, you know, looking, standing in front of a, a piece of uh, art, you know, you can never, you can never beat that. It's unbeatable. Um, and what, what, we, what we hope is that by giving as much access as possible via our digital channels, people started to, you know, get more curious. And one fine day they want to come and visit and see the real thing. And I think nothing can beat the real thing. So I'm not, I'm not too afraid of that. Um, I mean, yeah, basically that's my point. Yep. Katrin? I totally agree with Marika. The, we've been having this conversation for 25 years. It started with websites. When we started putting up websites, everybody got very concerned. We can't have a website because you know, it will take people away from the museum. Um, and we've been having that conversation ever since. Um, I don't think that this has to be a mutually exclusive. It's what Marilka said. It's, it's, it's not an either or conversation. It's an augmenting the physical ex experience and, it, and it, nothing replaces the physical experience, but not everybody, not everybody has access to the physical experience for a variety of reasons. Ramiro? I agree. I agree. And I think, uh, I think that is one of the, the issues that has to be taken into account. The digital part is not a, a, a reenactment of the physical. That has, to, that has to, to lead. We don't want to, to make the visit digitally necessarily. I think what, it, what is happening, it gives you um, many more opportunities of uh, going deeper into into collections going deeper into uh, conversations with uh, with artists into processes that you cannot have when you when you visit you cannot necessarily have when you visit a, a museum i think they will be complementary and i think they will work together to enrich the the whole uh, the whole experience 
Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I think it's like uh, th this. This is the kind of again uh, suspicious attitude that is typical of, uh, let's say, the, the the emergence of new possibilities and new technologies. Think, for example, of the long debate that there was, for example, in the music industry between people who were downloading digital, uh, for example, digital files and uh, buying actual, uh, let's say, records or in whatever form. And once uh, you really started to look into the market uh, as, as it actually worked out, it turned out that the people who downloaded the most were also the people who actually were willing to buy. Because of course, downloading was also a sampling strategy for people, especially for people with omnivorous tastes. So it's clearly, yeah, it's clearly not a contraposition. I think uh, probably uh, it also means that uh, the, let's say the older generations from this point of view should be made more comfortable with these new possibilities because it seems that uh, for this generation, the tension is much more relevant than for the younger generations for which I think seamless uh, toggling between the two possibilities is something rather natural today. And uh, to remain in the same ambit, Ambika asks, for example, what is uh, uh, the, the, the sphere of AI and cyber laws? How can, uh, we'll, uh, how can we integrate this uh, new uh, big dimension, of course, uh, in, from this point of view, from, 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 from the legal point of view, especially, into the more general sphere of the digital transition of museums? Can you... Uh Pierre, do you know any more about the context of the cyber laws? I guess I'm not quite sure what the, what the reference is. Well, I, as far as I can get from, from the question, is more like uh, in the more general regulation of the digital space. Uh, how are museums uh, involved in this? Uh, are museums, um, let's say, uh, is the museum's issues are relevant from the point of view of uh, of the regulation of cyberspace today, or they are, let's say, a minor minor point from this point of view? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm answering the question because I'm not sure I completely understand it. I'm going to, I'm going to make an assumption that the question is talking about um, the concerns about AI ethics, right? Right. Um, right, and, um, and then of course, a lot of the um, privacy regulations that exist in many parts of the world. I'm gonna assume that it's about that. Um, I think that these are now sort of like what we call table. Okay, great. So, so the person who answered the question confirmed that. Um, it, these are now table stakes, um, which means, you know, like, like an entry level conversation on everything. The, as happens with all technology, not just in 2020, but going back hundreds of years now, technology has always outpaced government regulations. Government regulations are now um, being discussed or are in place and in a way that has lagged um, the, the innovation and, we'll, and the, maybe that will always continue. The challenge um, is that now we have, to, we have to consider these and many other things that have not yet come to pass. Um, because again, back to this digital literacy, people are not yet aware of the risks. When it comes to specifically AI, um, then, you know, I, I often say that the conversation around AI is actually around individuals. So it's about when it identifies people um, or when it's about making decisions about people based on things that people can do. That's where the conversation is, is most impactful. There is a lot of AI still that has nothing to do with people and particularly in museums that still does not mean that we, we shouldn't do AI. And the reason I say that is because the only conversation people wanna have right now is about ethics and not about other applications of which there is little risk. When it comes to privacy, then absolutely, um, Europe has been leading the way on this um, and, Privacy is something that has definitely lagged for many, many years. We were um, we were um, challenged here in that it was the it was just you know very laissez faire kind of an approach. So, however, there is great risk here, and I think the issue with all technology has been that we haven't necessarily exposed where the risks are, and people are not literate about the risks. So there are others out there that haven't yet surfaced, but will. Um, it's a long way of saying that um, 
when you approach technology, it's not just about building the experience. There is also always a base layer of things that you have to consider. AI ethics is one, privacy is another, security, generally cybersecurity is another. There are many, many others. Um, so we have to think about this as a skill set when we build technologies. I'll pause there. Thank you, Catherine. This is my moment to remind you uh, that there is this survey that uh, we would be very grateful if you could contribute to, uh, to participate in. And uh, the survey, uh, you will find the link in the, in the chat. You have to copy and pa paste the address on your browser and uh, the, the survey questionnaire will open. It's just a couple of questions, so it's extremely quick and painless. But uh, if you can, really, you could uh, help us a lot by participating to the survey. And uh, in the chat, there was also this uh, curiosity about uh, who made uh, the curator videos from home that Maraki already addressed. But uh, I would like uh, to, to take this opportunity also to, to ask Maraike something I was curious about, how the idea came out in the first place. How, what, what was the reason why you decided that, that was the moment for the curators to speak from their homes? And uh, I mean, it's a very interesting idea and very peculiar. So I'm very curious about the process that led to this idea. Well, well our strategy uh, has already longer been that we want to um, connect uh, art history and people by telling personal stories, because we believe that's a very good way to really get into the hearts of people. So if, if a story is personal, and, and I think we all have the luxury that we know what it's like when you walk into a museum together with a curator, you stand in front of uh, uh, a painting or and this curator, curator starts telling you about this painting, that personal uh, story and that personal experience is, is you know, it's, it's priceless. Um, so personal stories is, is, was already part of our strategy. Um, and then we just started brainstorming. So what can we do? And we have, uh, we have great uh, curators and there are most of them, not all of them, but most of them are very well used to, you know, talking to cameras or talking to l large audiences. Um, and you actually, you need a first person who says, okay, I'm going to do it. And we had one guy and he's like our, one of our rock stars. And he said, uh, sure, I'll do it. And it's, if you see the whole video, he has a little role for his son in there as well. Um, and when you have one example, the rest will follow. So it's, it's yeah, you just need some, some people who wanna, wanna do it with you. And, and fortunately we have uh, enough of these people in our museum. No, that's super. And uh, if I think uh, of some museum curators, it would be fun to have uh the experience of seeing them broadcasting from home, which means, again, that uh, a change of mentality sometimes is called for to do for yeah. this. You know, generally, you you know, there is still a, this this church metaphor for me really works a lot to, to explain some of the rigidities of the museum environment and the feeling the high priest of the museum and uh, being uh, not being able, for example, to, to show your human side at home, maybe with children coming in, which I think is a great way to really explain to people that museum is just an, another domestic space in which they are invited in, uh, which I think uh, really makes the difference. Um, okay, maybe uh, we can also ask if there are questions from our uh, Yuka platform to the organizers. Maybe we could also address uh, some of the questions that are from there. Let's see if there is uh, any suggestion that arrives from... So, Beatrice asks, meanwhile, um, are there data about the percentage of people who physically visit the museum after having consulted their online version? Do you have any evidence for this? Oh, I wish, I wish we were that far. Um, we're not that far yet. Um, we are trying to, to get more data uh, out of this, but, but this is really a dream. If we can, if we can uh, show this and, and see how many people actually visit the museum. One um, number that is interesting to tell is that last year we had 2.7 million visitors to our museum, which was a high time record in our history, 2.7 million in a year. And with our content now, we reach 1 million people every week. 
So in terms of reach, um, that's that's enormous. And and I, I'm not sure which percentage is returning uh, visitors, but you know, 2.7 a year versus 1 million a week, that's that's quite substantial. Thank you. And Marijke, there is another question for you. How financially profitable is the digital branch of the Rijks Museum? Are the Rijks online shop is performing? Well, we, we, um, we uh, had a new uh, backend uh, last year. We implemented last year. So now we see the performance really growing uh, and that was really necessary. Our web shop wasn't that successful, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> Um, and till now, uh, our digital branch costs money uh, and, and, and doesn't necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily earn a lot yet. We are looking at several business models to see if we can earn money uh, with our digital content. But there's always the balance between the financial impact versus the impact on society. Because we are the National Museum, um, we have a role to make our art as ex and our collection as accessible as possible. And if you start asking money uh, for this uh, uh, information and these stories, you really have to think twice or maybe 10 times before you start doing that. Because yes, maybe you can earn some money. On the other hand, we have, an, we have a society, we have a role for society where we have an educational uh, role as well. So we are looking into it, um, but we haven't decided yet what the best approach is. Uh, and, and maybe we start, you know, testing little things. Um, but I think the coming at least two years, it will still cost money and not, not get that much uh, in return. Yeah, you know, this is a, this is a big debate uh, in many places. For example, um, Italy is a place where uh, this tension between... Uh, let's say making museums, uh, let's say more financially viable is always been part of the, of, the, of the national conversation. Also because sometimes there are also some strange ideas that uh, probably also pop up in different uh, countries like uh, since Italy is so strongly identified with culture, sometimes there is the idea that in some sense culture is our oil, this instrumentalist view. So that in some sense, the best way to make, to profit out of it would be to make museums more financially, if not only viable, even profitable, which of course is absurd because museums uh, cannot uh, make profits ordinarily. But uh, at the same time, yes, I think that this, this kind of issue is important because uh, still there is uh, for many people the difficulty in understanding that uh, certain cultural institutions are not designed to be profitable. They are designed to create certain type of impact that maybe can be a social impact, but uh, whose uh, also economic indirect impact can be very, very big. For example, today there is a huge attention towards the implications of museum participation for mental well-being and health. So clearly, of course, making people uh, more, uh, let's say, relieving, for example, stress from people, as it's been documented now happening in museums, can have a huge uh, important economic consequence, for example, on welfare systems as soon as this is generalized. But this is the kind of issues that are uh, typically overlooked. So um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's very important also that the museum community is more clear in explaining in some sense that the museum mission is much broader than simply, let's say, being financially viable or profitable and providing, let's say, access to collections is something that today really has to do with an orchestration of so many different functions. But now there are, we are getting close to the end. So I would ask my panelists, is there any question that you would have liked to be, to be asked? And uh, so you have a chance now to, to pose your question to yourself and, and giving as an answer. What, what, what is your missing question from this debate? If any. I'm going to rephrase it, <laughs> Pierre, sorry, into what did I learn from this debate? Okay. <laughs> if that's okay, because I think the, thing, the thing that was really important for me to understand is, is what ICOM has put together here is a very diverse audience, right? And I think that firstly demonstrates why we need diversity. But secondly, learning about the challenges in South America and Africa around digital access, around internet access, to me is, has been enlightening, right? I'm like, I'm aware of it, but actually hearing about it 
um, helps me understand the challenge. It's like people not having electricity. Um, and, uh, and even in the United States, the United States has challenges with this. Um, if you're not in a big city, rural areas are more challenged, right? What the impact of that is, is maybe the biggest takeaway for me and how to think about that. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, so I ask uh, the other panelists, what are their takeaways from this, from this uh, experience? And Ramiro? I'm trying to think, and uh, it touches on the, last, on the last comment about the financial issue. What it means, what it will mean in the future for our, for our, uh, for our budgets. I'm not uh, sure, even at this point, we are aware of, of what that will mean. In, in financially, the impact it will have financially on our on our uh, institutions. So that is something that I I, uh, I would like to hear a bit more how other how others are are, are dealing with it. Yeah, I think that uh, lots of peer learning of this would be advisable now because it's clear that there are different contexts. But on the other hand, there are also very many common elements in this crisis and probably this 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 element of peer learning is something that also ICOM I think should pursue more in the future because in a moment like this can really be a precious resource and uh, and Luisa what's your uh, what's your takeaway from this experience uh, yes my 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 takeaway from this is i am glad that everybody seems to agree that digital platforms virtual exhibitions digital transformation in whatever way it is done is not there to take the shine away from the physical museum work. Rather, it is there to, it's coming up to complement what we already have in the physical and the, the both are just complementary to each other. And digital transformation, digital platforms are necessary. They are, they are a necessary tool right now for museum work to go on progressively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luisa. And uh, Marike, what's your takeaway? Well, um, I have the same takeaway as uh, Catherine. Um, uh, once again, I realize how privileged we are here in the Netherlands uh, with the internet accessibility. For us, it's, it's really not a subject that we ever discuss, honestly, because it's just there. So. Realizing that a big part of the world uh, doesn't have this luxury. Um, and I think it would be interesting to see what we, the privileged countries, what we can do to really uh, help um, yeah, solve this issue. Because I really think that's a, it's, a, yeah, it's a big problem that we need to get out of this world. Thank you very much, Marike. So we are getting close to the end and uh, a very brief wrap up. Well, I think that uh, we really touched so many aspects in the, such a short time. I'm really, really impressed and surprised, but still this gives me again, the confirmation that today the debate in the museum world is really rich and very dynamic. And in particular, the fact that uh, this uh, pandemic crisis is not simply just a threat or an emergency to be solved. It's really becoming an accelerator of thought in many different respects. I think that this will remain with us also out uh, of the crisis. Hopefully, of course, the crisis will be, will be over as soon as possible. But even if this will be the case, as we all uh, wish for, I think that uh, many, of the, many of the learnings uh, of this experience are staying with us just because we are understanding that uh, this digital dimension is also enabling the enabling possibilities that we would not have been considering uh, before. Just to make an example, a conference like this, uh, let's say six months ago, would have been uh, probably a physical conference with uh, relatively few people arriving with an enormous environmental impact and probably also taking away at least two days for most of the people attending from all over the world. This, uh, by the way, was what, uh, how I lived up to six months ago. And honestly, I would never switch back to that. Never, because uh, it's uh, absolutely clear that what, is, oh, sorry about that. Uh, I have to <laughs> stop. Uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, what's happening today 
is uh, from this point of view, uh, creating new possibilities uh, in terms of, for example, our worldwide participation uh, and, uh, and uh, inclusive access, for example, for conferences like this, uh, which are not only environmentally more sustainable, but much more pl pluralistic than they could have been in normal circumstances. Well, I think that the, this, of course, uh, is not uh, enough because, as we said, uh, clearly there is no real possibility of access if the digital media are precluded to a large share of the population. This does not solve the problem. But on the other hand, this problem is solvable. Uh, it, the technological emergency in itself can be fixed if there is enough targeted investment. What is more important, and I think it emerged very richly from the debate, is the social transformation that makes this possible. And the social transformation is uh, still very complex. We are in the early stages of it. And so it's extremely important now that, uh, for example, the international institutions working on education and development focus on this, not just the museum environment. I think it would be extremely important from this point of view to have a closer collaboration between um, the museum community and such institutions. So in the case of OECD, this is already happening. Of course, there is an intense dialogue with the UNESCO also on this as well. But I think that, for example, the World Bank would be probably a very important interlocutor from this point of view. And uh, even, I mean, the institutions that have to do with the financial regulation of the global system, like, for example, the International Monetary Fund, could have a say on this, or in particular, could be involved in, um, in a complex agenda setting. As a European, I can say that the European uh, Union, for example, has been extremely active from this point of view and um, has also proposed a very, very interesting agenda, the so-called new European agenda for culture in terms of the social uh, impact for, and transformational impact of cultural participation for the next seven years. So I think we have plenty of possibilities to pick up uh, the suggestions and the opportunities that come from a forum like this. And I'm particularly grateful to ICOM for uh, creating a forum for this and also for, uh, of course, uh, further pursuing this kind of uh, dialogue and also concrete uh, activation and stimulation of museum professionals. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to the next meetings uh, of this series. And thank you for uh, all their wonderful insights to our panelists. Bye. Thank you, bye.